Hello and welcome to National Invasive Species Awareness Week 2023. My name is Elizabeth Brown and I serve as the Director of Government Relations here at NASMA. Thank you for joining us today for our third NISA webinar of the week, the Water Resources Development Act Provisions for Invasive Species Prevention, Management and Research. Thank you to each of our speakers for partnering with NASMA on this important event and thanks to everyone watching today. All right, with that, I am going to stop my share and invite our first presenter to share his screen and begin our webinar. So our first presenter today is Jeremy Crossland, who is the Land Use and Natural Resource Manager with the U.S. Army Corp of Engineers. Thanks for the quick introduction. Afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk to you about WERDA from the core perspective overall, not just inspection stations, and how we got there from the 1800s. So pre-WERDA, how WERDA works and how appropriations work for the Corps of Engineers, and then uh, some highlights of what is going on in the recent years. So the first specific Corps bill was 1824, and this was the precursor to the Rivers and Harbors Act. And it didn't have anything to do with invasive species or plants specifically. It was, it charged us with clearing the Ohio and Mississippi rivers from sandbars and obstacles. It wasn't until 1899 that they started the Rivers and Harbors Act, which is really for the core not for other agencies, uh, it was the precursor to what we know as WERDA today. And this, in 1899, it authorized us to manage water hyacinths, for, and that was the first invasive species legislation that the Corps of Engineers saw. So it charged us with the removal and management of water hyacinths in, Louisiana, in Florida and Louisiana. And this went on for a few decades. In the 40s, people in the southeast are still battling it today, but Another plant, alligator weed, became a prevalent problem. And in 1958, the Rivers and Harbors Act created the Aquatic Plant Control Program, which we're still using today. And you can see in 58, it charged us with the control of obnoxious aquatic plant growth. So anyway, that's just fun. And that, was, that, that language was the foundation of the Aquatic Plant Control Program. In 59, the following year, we it recognized that research efforts under the Aquatic Plant Control Program would be at full federal expense, whereas work, other work is cost-shared with a local sponsor. So at that time, it was 70-30. Later, it would become 50-50 as it is today, but we recognized that research would be done at full federal expense. 65, again, I know you guys can read these, but it, you know, that... We were authorized $5 million for control and research in 1965. So that was a big chunk of money in the federal budget then. It's a, probably a rounding error today. 1973, we designated Rivers and Harbors designated the Waterways Experiment Station, which today is known as Erdic, the Erdic Environmental Lab, but Vicksburg, Mississippi as the lead laboratory for aquatic plant research. And we've been engaged in aquatic plant management research ever since even before that but that was that legislation officially charged us with establishing a center at west and we've operated it and ever since 1980 not really important to our non-federal partners but rivers and harbors excuse me authorized us to establish the aquatic plant control operations and support center in the Jacksonville district. And this was this was recognizing that we had a need within the core, not just with our non-federal partners, to have a way to send technical expertise out to our district. So this just it established Jacksonville district as a center and gave us the mechanism to use their staff across the country to help us solve aquatic plant issues that were impacting Corps of Engineers projects. So the Water Resources Development Act, as we fondly refer to as WERDA, right? The first one 
It was 1986, and it's public law 99-662. Why no more rivers and harbors? A couple of things happened. For the Corps of Engineers, they recognized that we weren't just doing navigation in rivers and harbors, right? There was a lot else going on within the core ecosystem restoration, hydropower production, flood risk management, all these activities, right? And we've been doing most of them since the late 1800s. But it also, Water Resources Development Act, for as people know, is not just for the Corps of Engineers, right? All of the water resource agencies get budgeted this way. So Bureau of Reclamation is in there and other agencies. So it merged us into one bill and we each have our own section. But what we're really doing with an authorization and when it comes to the programs that we work within, the aquatic plant control program, we're really still just amending the original rivers and harbors, right? 33 USC 610 is the control of aquatic plant aquatic plant control growth. And that's the U.S. code. So every time that we make a change or a change is authorized within WERDA, we, we the core, do not make that. When Congress makes a change through authorization in WERDA, it's amending this USC each time. So we get it, that legislation and it becomes part of this U.S. code. And then we follow the U.S. code as the and we carry out those authorizations. And you'll see these from Jonas. I'm not trying to steal from him. I'm not going to talk about the watercraft inspection stations. I just, it, there's a, the highlight here is 2014, other than watercraft inspection stations, is it changed the USC from invasive aquatic plants to aquatic invasive species. And this gave us the ability to specifically work on quagga zebra mussels, aka we're doing watercraft inspection stations and monitoring, but it would, it could lead to control activities. It can, it allows us the capability to work on any invasive species, aquatic invasive species. And then I think most of us are familiar and we'll see from Jonas in much more detail how this stuff plays out. But th these are just the recent word as and what has changed within them. We're just adding new areas to it. And we're adding new areas of authorization or specific activities, which is one way that we accomplish new work through the aquatic plant control program. And why is that? Most invasive species management folks are very familiar with this chart or some version of this. And what we're trying to do with the aquatic plant control program is we're trying to prevent, eradicate, con and contain to prevent long-term management issues. And that's been the goal since the 1950s is to work in the the low the lower left edge of this, right? We want to prevent and we want to eradicate new issues. And then also, if we can't do that, we're trying to contain the issue to minimize long-term O&M for the Corps of Engineers and others. And that's why we cost share to work off of core projects through this program. And it allows us that capability to work with partners to control an issue before it becomes a core owned issue per se or downstream in other ways to just buy down risk of invasive species for all of us. So each year, so we get authorizations as I described, right? And that gives us these capabilities through the program. And what, what's going on right now? Through the recent budget, these are the kind of highlights of what we, what we're working with in FY23. Aquatic Invasive Species Research, right? That's the Aquatic Plant Control Research Program. Everybody refers to as APCRP. We received $7 million this year, and we're gonna be working on new control strategies, either for new species or some of the oldest ones, like water hyacinth. We're working on things like overspray to try to get a better handle on understanding how much herbicide goes in the water during a foliar treatment. We're looking at new control techniques for hydrilla and other submerged plants and flowing water. We're always exploring new biocontrols. It's an extremely cost-effective way to do business if we can find successful ones. And something that's come up in the last two budget cycles is this next bullet, flowering Russian hydrilla. And we're trying to demonstrate these new technologies that we're researching at a field scale level, right? We're looking for places and opportunities to do field level control work on flowering rush and hydrilla. 
And so we're working with a list of stakeholders and try and we're going to put out again, field scale demonstrations of re recent research to, to work with these new control technologies at the field level and conduct and try to continue to improve them and share these technologies with not just non-federal sponsors, but other feds also. And then the oldest part of the program is the cost share, right? And there's cost share on watercraft inspection stations, which again, Jonas will get into. And then in FY23, we've got about two and a half billion dollars to do what we sometimes refer to as traditional cost share work, which is invasive plants, what we've done since the 50s. And so we're working with non-federal sponsors to create agreements to do to conduct work on hydrilla and giant salvinium and then out of the box or not out of the box but a sort of like the new is to explore working with northern pike as a cost share in fy23 and then we're always looking for opportunities to be able to cost share on rapid response activities which can be more complicated but it's keeping it's trying to work in the early detection rapid response area. So there's a lot on the screen here, but, and I'm not going to talk about it in detail. Again, I think Jonas will highlight some of these things for watercraft inspection station and how it's changed, but this is what our appropriations looks like. And it's separate from WERDA, right? We get authorization through WERDA and we get appropriation Anybody can look at that later if they would like, but this is what's really important for people to understand is WERDA authorizes, energy and water appropriates. And so what does this mean to stakeholders and non-federal sponsors? It's fine for us to get an authorization through WERDA that tells us we're authorized to do the following activity, but we can't do that activity until we get an appropriation that tells us you are appropriated dollars for that activity. And I'm going to flash back one more time again, not to confuse folks, but that's what's happening here is the sub-program appropriations is giving us specific tasks that we're allowed to work on. And that's, that's what makes the program really work, whether you're worried about watercraft inspection stations or killing in hydrilla. So, so with, that's all I got on the, how the sort of nuts and bolts of Wardo works. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Jeremy. That was great. All right, our next presenter today is Stephen Phillips, Senior Program Manager with the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, who will be presenting an overview of the Columbia River Basin's Aquatic Invasive Species Program. Go ahead and share your screen. And just a reminder, if you have questions for any of our speakers during today's event, go ahead and type those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Thanks, folks. Great to be with you today. I'll talk a little bit about some of the background of the Columbia River Basin AS program and also some APC WID WERDA work that we're doing with the core. We've been working on at the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission on invasive species since 1999. Our main species right now are quagga and zebra mussels. I want to thank our staff, admin Amy Stark, GAS manager Van Heeren, and especially our contractors. Lisa Deborah Kerr, Quaggy D. Davis, Leah Elwell, and Robin Draheim. These are the folks that get all the work done in our program. I want to thank our uh, funding agencies, Bonneville, Fish and Wildlife Service, Sport Fish, Wallet Bro, and Army Corps of Engineers. A little bit of history to set the stage. In 1990, the NANC was passed. And that created, as most many the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force, the regional panels. And then in, in 1996, NISA was passed. And this was important because it created the 100th Meridian Initiative. And then you can see that document, 100th Meridian Initiative, a strategy to prevent zebra mussels from moving west was done in 2001. 
at the same time, uh, we started getting concerned about the Lewis and Clark Trail Bicentennial that was supposed to have thousands of watercraft recreating the journey. And it didn't turn out that way, actually. There weren't very many boats that did it. But what it did do is tied the Missouri and much of the West to the Columbia River Basin and with the issue, our muscles gonna be moving across the country in this event. So for us, it was a good time to coordinate across many boundaries. This is what the 100th Meridian Initiative group looked like at the beginning in the early 2000s. An interesting mix of agencies. And so then what happened after this document there on the left came out, the Fish and Wildlife Service formed uh, basin teams that you can see there. Those are the six that I could find. And now we've got two, two active basins. The Missouri River is funded by the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Columbia River, which is funded by Fish and Wildlife Service and BPA. The HunterthMeridian.org website does not exist. It, the URL was not re renewed many years ago. That information was transferred to WesternAS.org, which is the PSMFC website. And it, the question always comes up, what's going on with coordination? Well, you can see there on the bottom left, there is a lot of stuff that's gone on since the 100th Meridian Initiative the WRP, Quagga Zebra Action Plan, building consensus in the West, the regional defense of the Pacific Northwest, safeguarding the West, QZAP, Whiskey, and then also the WGA as well, Western Governors Association. So the 100th Meridian was a great idea to try to stop them there. However, muscles started getting over that false border. And in 2007, this is the photo of the first mussel found in Lake Mead by Wen Baldwin, God rest his soul, in January 8, 2007. Those of us in the Northwest and elsewhere thought, boy, this is going to be expensive. We've only got hundreds of thousands of dollars per state to battle this expanding population. And we really need millions. And so for where we are, you've probably heard that uh, salmon and steelhead are a big deal, and they are. There's a sockeye salmon fish going up and down the Columbia River need to go up fish ladders. And then they come back down. They are guided by traveling fish screens in front of the turbines. And when those fish screens don't operate, the turbines don't run. So electricity isn't generated. So it's important to keep these clean. Hydropower water impact, you guys know about this, but we were showing and seeing what was going on in the Great Lakes. There's a cooler unit, Ontario Hydro, I think on the Niagara River. There's some trash racks at Hoover Dam from the, the eventual infestation there. And again, we know we needed significant money to be able to battle this. So we started a legislative push with a lot of partners. So going back even into the 2000s, and we found that the Water Resources Development Act was a target for AIS funding. And then, it's not miraculous, but we got great across the aisle, Democrat, Republican support especially from these folks to get the watercraft inspection monitoring into the WERDA bill as Jeremy mentioned. And it was an effort by a lot of different people. Our plans, planning council up here in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest Economic Region, Flathead Basin Commission, us, Representative in Idaho, Eric Anderson, tribe states, many others were behind this. And as I was digging around in the hot tub time machine last night on my hard drive, I came across this. And this is the original letter that went to 
Ray Hall and Schuster telling them that, hey, in the Senate bill, there's some which on invasive species in the word of bill, and we'd like you, we need to get that in the house. And then the interesting part is the partners that signed up on this, Mike Simpson, he's a heavyweight, Mike Thompson, Jonas will tell us about the Russian River, that's where Mike Thompson is. And then there are some people on this list that are still there and they don't get along very well. But we got them, all of us combined, to sign on to this letter, pushing WERDA towards the finish line. And so in 2017, it was mentioned by Jeremy that we signed a PA partnership agreement with Walla Walla Corps of Engineers to, uh, to administer the APC WIG cost share program for the four states. And then last year in Nevada and Wyoming, we added those as well. The program began in 2017. And then what, the, what that looks like flashing the 2023 six state spending total for monitoring watercraft inspections is going to be about $14 million. And that's a huge increase from where we were in the early 2000s of just hundreds of thousands of dollars. The other important part of the WERDA program is because of the cost share, we need to have a lot of partners. And so we've got state, tribal, NGO, you see a VISTA down there, Bonneville Power Administration, lots of different partners that, have, that, that work on this program now. And what has it done to our inspection and decontamination and inspection and interception numbers? You can see 2017 there that uh, this is when the word of APC WIB began. That's when we started getting our funding. And we were picking up 50, going back in time, 50, 75 boats a year. And that now has steadily increased. In, in 2021, dry seeded filed watercrafts were well over 200. And then at watercraft inspections, again, we were around 150,000 inspections. Now we're up well into the hundreds, multi hundreds of thousands with a peak of over 350,000 in 2020, probably related to COVID and people going out and boating a lot more. The program and the influx of funds has also allowed us to expand operations. A few of the stations now are open 365 days a year, and every, sometimes stations are open at night. Um, stations are all also open longer, so we got a lot more coverage, and that's reflected in the increase in inspections and interceptions. Briefly, want to go over some PSMFC resources on quad and zebra mussels and AIS. That's our website. Some of you may have done our watercraft inspection day training with D. Davis. Go to the water watercraft inspection training tab on Western AIS, and you can get more information there. I'm going to show you a watercraft inspection map, a monitoring map, and then on rapid response, I'll show you a slide on CRB dirt. And then our newsletter that just came out yesterday, Robin Draheim's the editor, and you can sign up for that as well. So this is the map that we have. And this is 2022. It's going to be updated the next couple of weeks. 20, 2023 usually goes up in March. And this can be found on our site. You click on those beetles, and then what happens, it will pop up and show you when the station's open. Now, of interest on this is we had a, a Western AAS coordinators meeting a couple of weeks back. and we had a discussion of, do we really want to have this thing up on the web? And we've had this discussion on and off for the last five, six years, because apparently some people will go and then use this to cheat and get around the stations instead of its intended purpose to help coordinate that folks to get to a station at the appropriate time. 
Um, resource managers do use this so that we can coordinate where the stations are, putting them in the most appropriate place. And this will be especially important as more APC WID word of funds come into the upper Colorado and upper Missouri. And Jonas is going to talk about that. We have, we've been keeping a monitoring data set for, oh, 10 plus years. You can click on the, click on it and it will, the, the data for each site will pop up. It's nothing fancy. I've got eDNA highlighted there because yesterday there was a lot of eDNA talk. USGS has got quite a bit of funding and they're moving forward to that. It sounds really exciting. Potentially this could be of help to USGS. They have reached out to us and asked about what kind of eDNA information we have. And we have some. And again, you can go to westernas.org monitoring and bring that map up. And this will be updated with 2022 data next week. Another program that was started in late 2021 and now into 2022 by Lisa Deborah Cares is called Before Your Hall program. What we always trying to do is identify those boats that are coming across, especially from the Great Lakes into the Pacific Northwest, but also out of Lake Mead and Texas and other water bodies. And so what this does, it's up on the DOT sites of all the states. And when they're getting a permit, they see this and they can call an 800 number we have set up. And then the operator will then send that information to the destination state. And it's worked, it's worked well. We've been able to capture and inform more of the haulers out there, though there's still work to do. We have most of the Western states set up. We're expecting Nebraska, Mississippi, and West Virginia to come on soon. Texas, so far, is a no-go. We talk about rapid response a lot. And one of the things we did, this is Lisa's project, bdirt.com. If you're going to put chemicals in the water to kill mussels, you're going to need, you're going to need a permit. So we worked with Fish and Wildlife Service funding. We worked with Fish and Wildlife Service and then NOAA to identify all the ESA and EPA concerns that need to be made, that, that, that are needed if you're going to whack some mussels. In, in the Pacific Northwest, we already know that if you try to, a copper product, a copper sulfate and salmon may not mix. So you'd probably get steered towards uh, potassium product instead. Um, there's also other information on here, reference documents in case you're interested, but this is the part, this ESA consultation that we had, we've identified over the years is you got to get that straightened out if you're going to get chemicals in the water quickly. So we do host some meetings. So these are mostly Western. I'll just give you a heads up, Pacific Ballast Water Group is meeting March 28th and 29th at the lovely double tree at the Seattle airport. Columbia River Basin team is going to be in Boise in June. We're working on a Missouri River Basin team. And again, these are the old 100th Meridian teams. And we're thinking summer, perhaps July of 2023. And it may be in person. Further information will be coming out, and Leah Elwell is the contact for both the basin teams. Uh, finally, the aquatic invasive species news we put out has been 15 years now since we've been doing it. Back in 2008, our original editor was Joan Cabresa, and she was with EPA in Seattle. And she was the coordinator. And I put that in quotes because at the time, Joan, this is where she really gained fame. She really had to fight to be the coordinator for EPA in Seattle. They didn't see it as one of their main missions. She noticed a gap and she did a great job. And so eventually 
this was turned into the AAS News. And then out of the blue, a couple of weeks ago, after years, I get an email from Joan, and she's got this book now, Searching, A Biologist's Journey. So you can Google that and please buy it. Joan's done a lot of really cool things in her lifetime. And you can see Costa Rican jungle, Asia, Philippines, Guam. And I think she talks about cats and for invasives. I know she, she talks about cats and rats. So there's a couple of things there for you to, to look at. So yeah, buy this book. That's what I got. There's the email address for me. And welcome questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Stephen. The work of the Columbia River Basin certainly benefits people all across the country. So we appreciate you and all the partners. And with that, we'll turn to one of those partners now. We'll move from the regional level to the state level. Our next presenter is Tom Wolf, the Aquatic Invasive Species Bureau Chief for the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Tom will be discussing the benefits and challenges of WARDA to the state of Montana's Aquatic Invasive Species Program. Everything looks great, Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. So today I'm going to be giving you a brief overview of what went on in Montana with the detection of mussels in the state in 2017. Montana's had an invasive species program for a long time, it had a watercraft inspection program since 2002, but the detection of mussels in Montana really elevated the program, and it was fortunate that it coincided with the development of WERDA, the APC WID program, putting that additional funding on the ground to support watercraft inspection and AIS prevention. Mussels were first detected in Montana in November 2016. It was samples that were collected from that summer. They were analyzed late in the season, and that's when invasive mussel larvae were detected in Canyon Ferry and Tiber Reservoirs. The governor at the time declared a natural resource emergency, allowing additional resources and state funding to be dedicated to the containment and prevention of aquatic invasive mussels from moving from one place to another. An incident command team was put in place, and the Legislature in Montana is every other year. So it just so happened legislature was in session at that time. New legislation was created. New funding was allocated as well as additional staff, which included my position. And all this coincided with the, a lot of other people, the people that Stephen was talking about, were working on getting word up earmarked for watercraft inspection. And so that allowed Legislators at the time, they were able to access the aquatic plant control, watercraft inspection, decontamination dollars as they developed our funding and our program blueprint for moving forward, which was very fortuitous. Those are the two locations where those mussel populations were detected. Both of those populations had a containment program set up around them. So making sure all watercraft leaving those waters were clean, drain, dry, and if needed, decontaminated to prevent the spread of invasive mussels out of those water bodies and into different basins. Also with the laws and regulations in Montana, mandatory inspection before launch was required for all watercraft entering the state, crossing west over the continental divide and entering the Flathead River Basin on top of mandatory exit inspections on Canyon Ferry and Tiber Reservoir. Also, we ended up with expanded enforcement, expanded early detection survey, expanded outreach and education, expanded partner involvement with the aquatic invasive species issue. And all this was supported with the APC WID funding with a 50-50 match. So the state provided half that funding and was leveraged with this Corps of Engineer funding. Montana's invasive species program is for the most part totally leveraged thanks to the contributions of the APC WID program with that 50-50 match. In response to mussels, we expanded our watercraft inspection program. We conducted intensive survey using all the tools in the toolbox, including mussel detection canines and environmental DNA. We had an extensive statewide outreach campaign 
or the Protect Our Logo, Logos tagline, or Protect Our Waters tagline is a call to action and then a clean drain dry is an action to help to help get that clean or to protect our waters objective is to get the public involved with the clean drain dry message. So six years later, where are we at? No further mussels have been detected in Montana, which is great news. An intensive survey has found no further evidence of mussels. Our mussel positive waters were delisted. So over five years of no detection in our mussel water bodies, no villagers were found, no DNA evidence was found. So those mussel positive water bodies no longer require mandatory exit inspections. We still sample the heck out of them, but no evidence of mussels exists in Montana at this time that we've seen, which is great news. What we have for funding now, Montana's Invasive Species Program is funded through a state, in-state, out-of-state angler fees, out-of-state motorized and non-motorized vessel fees, and a fee on hydroelectric power generation for our larger hydroelectric power producers. All of that is leveraged through the APC WID Army Corps of Engineers funding, which allows us to do double what we would have been able to do otherwise because of that funding. And also to acknowledge support from Fish and Wildlife Service Bureau Reclamation and U.S. Forest Service, which also contribute to our aquatic invasive species effort in the state. And then all of that contributes to these local partnerships that we have statewide, where in Montana, we've tried to work with local communities and local interested groups to stand up the programs on the ground. So for watercraft inspection, we work with tribes and conservation districts provide funding directly to them through a contract. We train them, we set them up, we provide oversight and QAQC, but they're the on the ground entity that's getting the work done in their local communities. And it's been an extremely successful model to improve quality control, improve attention to detail, also improve local community involvement, aquatic invasive species issue. And then also acknowledging we work really closely with National Park Service and the city of Whitefish, who all run watercraft inspection stations that aren't funded by the state, but we coordinate closely with them, provide resources and training, and that type of thing. This is where watercraft inspection stations are in Montana now, the little blue squares, again, focusing on state borders, continental divide, and then going into the Flathead River Basin. Inspection numbers, you can see that bump in 2016 when mussels were detected in the state that coincides with WERDA. And those numbers have continued to climb. There was a bump during COVID, and now I think we've stabilized for a really robust ongoing program for watercraft inspection, preventing the movement of aquatic invasive species on watercraft. Also emphasizing that we check these boats, but we're really trying to educate each one of those boaters that come through the station to make sure they do their part to clean, drain, dry, and aren't part of the problem and help protect the waters of Montana from aquatic invasive species. That's one graphic from our station in Eastern Montana, our Weibo station, just showing the watercraft that go through that station, where they're coming from in one year. And people move boats a long ways as they travel in the country. And they're also coming from a lot of places with a lot of nasty aquatic invasive species we don't have and don't want in the state. We've Intercepted about 200 mussel fowl vessels in the last five years in Montana's program, and this is where they're coming from. The red dots are where they're coming from, the blue dots are where they're going. Again, all this has been supported through that APC grid program. This is where mussels are known to occur now in the continental U.S., Hot, really highlighting that star in South Dakota right now. That's a detection that occurred this last season. Mussels are now, zebra mussels are now in the Black Hills, 70 miles from Montana, 20 miles from Wyoming. A new opportunity for prevention, working really closely with Bureau of Reclamation, the state of South Dakota, state of Wyoming, and the Army Corps of Engineers to try to figure out how we can make sure containment occurs down in that Black Hills population in Lake Peck. That plan is still developing, but it is the highest priority for Western states right now is to make sure that mussels aren't moving out of that water body into other waters. And then the star in 
Colorado is a new detection that occurred there this season as well. The state of Colorado intends to eradicate that population. So stay tuned to that. That's a great story that's unfolding, will be unfolding this spring. Also to mention, early detection is a, another major portion of our program in Montana. Again, you can see that bump in 2016 when mussels were detected in the state. Um, or the Army Corps of Engineers also supports our early detection survey program provides about $300,000 a year to support our early detection survey. So that has contributed to our early detection sampling in the state. Sampling statewide, but focusing on areas with highest use like Fort Peck and Flathead Lake, as well as looking at places like Tyburn Canyon Ferry, just in case there's something still hiding out there. And again, no further evidence of muscles there. Outreach partnerships, we work really closely with our partners to deliver the clean drain dryer message to local level, working with tribes, NGOs, utilities. Again, just a great way to get information out at the local level and compelling people to do the right thing and clean their watercraft before they move from one place to another. So the title of my talk was Successes and Challenges. And I think we've talked about a lot of great successes. We'll end on just a couple little challenges that we see out there. The availability of 50-50 match is a challenge for some of these new basin states that are coming online, just because the level of funding they have to match that 50-50 match will be a challenge in some locations, which will limit the amount of work they can do on the ground. Also, the, the approval of those other basins besides Columbia Basin, Jeremy mentioned that early on. It's been a long time coming to try to get this new funding available. And it's just been a little frustrating because it, it's been coming, but bureaucracy and all that, it, it's, um, it's been slow coming. And then also to mention, Kansas has seen some challenges because of some language errors in the original allocation indicating the Arizona River Basin instead of the Arkansas River Basin, which that is being corrected, but it puts Kansas even farther behind in getting some of that funding for the central states. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Tom. The AIS program in Montana is certainly a model for for others to follow. So I appreciate you sharing your experiences with us today. All right, we are gonna go back to the Army Corps of Engineers. Our next presentation is titled Implementing the 2018 and 2020 WERDA Authorizations to Expand Watercraft Inspection and Decontamination Monitoring and Rapid Response to New Basins. And this will be presented by Jonas Grunman, who is a natural resource specialist with the Walla District of the Army Corps of Engineers. So welcome, Jonas. Go ahead and share your screen. A little tiny, okay. but it looks good. All right. Excellent. So thank you for having me. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to chat. And as I've been listening to the other presenters, I've modified the presentation a little bit. So if you see some duplicate slides, we're all partners, we share information. And then I've added a few that may not be in the file that I provided. So I'll send you an updated file when we get a little bit later. But anyway, yeah, so I'm here to talk about the Water Resources Development Act, really the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1958, and how the Corps of Engineers has been and is continuing to implement watercraft inspection cost share programs, along with some other authorities, really with the expansion of that from the Columbia River Basin, as we heard about from some of our previous speakers. Okay, before I really get started, I need to take a moment and just really acknowledge, I know a lot of our partners here that have spoken previously, Tom, Steven, Jeremy are all listed in one way or another on this, but I just really wanna emphasize the extent of the team effort to get this program on the ground and implemented, extend massive apologies, the Corps of Engineers is a bureaucracy, like a lot of federal agencies, and it can take us a little longer to get things done, as Tom alluded to, than maybe the need or the demand would actually suggest. So a lot of great partners, not only within the Corps, outside of the Corps. I've been in the program for two years. Obviously, this has been happening for a lot longer than that, so I'm standing 
on the shoulders of giants, as you were. So just acknowledging all of that. So just some bottom lines, real quick messages to share. For the Corps of Engineers, aquatic invasive species really impact all of our missions, especially on the civil work side, but including probably our military missions as well. But on the civil work side, recreation, ecosystem restoration, water resource infrastructure, whether that's hydropower, flood control, water conveyance, all of these missions that the Corps of Engineers have are directly impacted as a water resource agency by aquatic invasive species. The focus is really on zebra and quagga mussels currently, but we talk a lot about aquatic plants. They're also a massive issue. And we know that for quagga and zebra mussels, the most common vector is boat traffic. And on the slide, I have recreational, but I should probably amend that to include industrial equipment as well, which could also convey from in-water work to another water body. So really any human mediated traffic is the issue. And from the slide that we saw earlier, I think from Jeremy showing that kind of invasion curve and where your efforts are best placed, we know that prevention is where you get the most bang for your buck. If you get over on that right hand side, you're spending a lot of money and a lot of time to control your issues. So thus our authority to help with watercraft inspections, rapid response and monitoring efforts for early detection. And really, and as you saw prior to 2014, the Corps of Engineers lacked authority to support some of these regional programs. And being a water resource agency for the nation really hindered our ability to support some of these other efforts. And so we were, were happy to receive the authority in 2014 so we could actually come to the table, not just be a participant sitting at the table who can't bring anything to it, but actually you know, put some money on the ground and show some support. And then I'm here really to talk about some of our expanded authorities with those word of acts from 2018 and 2020 on the status. I'm going to go over the basics. We saw variation of this slide earlier. If you go look up the code, you will see that it says control of aquatic plant growths. That's still the technical title for this section of US code, even though it now includes all aquatic invasive species. And it really provides for a large scale program, as Jeremy mentioned. Again, also within Rivers and Harbors Act, it defines for the watercraft inspection program, we have some other national authorities, but for watercraft inspection, we're authorized to help protect very specific basins. Columbia, the Upper Missouri, Colorado, South Platte, Arkansas, the Russian River Basin in California. We also have an authority for any basin that adjoins the international border between the United States and Canada, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Now, if you don't hear about us operating in your region, it may be that it's a new authority for you, or we just currently don't have that authorization to support your watercraft inspection programs. So what are we allowed to do? So also within the same act, we're, we also have the authority to assist states with rapid response efforts on the ground to help control an outbreak of aquatic invasive species, again, focusing maybe on quagga and zebra mussels. And then it defines the cost share. It's a 50-50. As Tom alluded to, that can be a problem for some states. I believe they'd like to see more of a 75-25 setup, which would be more beneficial and not that I'm not supportive, but we're constrained by the letter of the law. All right, so I added these slides at the last minute just because I wasn't sure if we were clearly talking about what a watercraft inspection station was. So this is very basic information. I apologize if it's overkill or too basic, but really we're talking about any location where watercraft are inspected for the presence of AI. I have officially, I need to modify that word because we do also support unmanned stations who are perfectly willing, depending on a state's authority and how they can set up a program to help fund voluntary stations where boaters are just reminded and encouraged and provided the tools to conduct an inspection themselves. But the typical program is a manned station, either volunteers, contractors, something like that. It can be along a major transportation corridor, highways, interstates, major roadways. They can be permanent. The state of Washington, Montana, they have a lot of permanent stations that exist every season. They can be temporary, only put up as needed, or roving stations. The state of Nebraska operates a mainly roving station program where they go out during high, when they can, with the horses they have, and they do a great job getting to those boat ramps where it would have the highest risk of infestation or the greatest impact to the state, and really do a great education and inspection activity that way. 
like I said, a variety of typically it's going to be a state agency authority that allows an inspection station to exist at a particular location, but it can be other jurisdictions, municipalities, county governments, water boards, if they have that, if they're a governmental organization, they could be supported by law enforcement. So you could have highway patrol or game wardens on site who may be able to go remind a a bypasser who maybe missed the inspection station that they need to come back and be inspected. They can be staffed by contractors or volunteers. So it's not always going to be a game and parks or wildlife employee directly on site. A lot of stations are mandatory, although some are voluntary. It just depends on the state's authority and the program they're able to roll out. If a watercraft is contaminated, what happens? A couple different things can occur. It can be decontaminated on site if that location has that ability. The picture on the right shows the catchment basin as well, so they can collect that water, make sure it doesn't go off into the uh, off into the environment. They can be directed to another location to have that cleaned. They can be requested to keep that watercraft out of the water until X number of days has passed to hopefully dry and desiccate any of the aquatic life that may be harbored on that boat. And in some situations, and I'll emphasize this is rare, but you do hear about it occasionally, there could be such an egregious infestation on that watercraft or that piece of equipment that it is held or impounded. And that's you know the, up to the local or state government on how their authorities on how that works. And so I have the caveat at the bottom here that state and local regulations will differ. I used to say may differ, but they will differ. <laughs> They're always gonna be a little different. We talk through these regional programs, either in the Columbia River Basin or the Missouri River Basin, and a lot of states are really trying to not only align their efforts, but also their policies to look similar and give the public a general sense of consistency across the region. Rapid response, we have the ability to, like I said, assist a state with a rapid response action, including planning for that action. So advanced thinking on how you may respond to something a training exercise on site to actually, you know, imagine that there is an infestation, you've just found it, you go out there, how do you handle it? Where do you put the booms? What kind of act actions do you take on that? So we help fund some of those efforts as well. I think Stephen mentioned ESA compliance or just general environmental compliance. So as a federal agency, we're potentially expending federal dollars. There are compliance things that we have to do for a rapid response actions. So if we were getting proposals to actually place chemical or anything in the waterways or on the ground, that's something that we would then require additional environmental compliance to determine if it fits and that we're not causing more issues than we're solving. Monitoring, again, early detection, rapid response, we need to be able to detect. So we also fund, as Tom alluded to, a lot of monitoring efforts throughout the regions. So I think we currently have $3 million that has been appropriated for monitoring across the program. And so we help fund the state's monitoring efforts, whether that's pulling water quality samples for the detection of villagers, which are the microscopic little babies of zebra and quagga mussels, or eDNA, RNA sampling, anything like that, or even water quality just to determine risk susceptibility of those waterways. All right. So into the meat of it, like where we're at now and where we're heading with our expanded authorities in 2018 and 2020. And there is a word of 2022, but it didn't really amend the program in any significant ways. All right. All right. So 2014, that's when our program kicked off. We got the original authority and actually it was limited to just four states, Washington, Oregon, Montana, and Idaho. And then was we we're able to expand that through additional congressional authority to add Wyoming and Nevada because the Columbia River Basin in light green, and I don't know if my cursor shows, does touch those two states. And so protecting that basin in those states is also important. Word of 2018 authorized a wide swath of additional basins. The upper Missouri in this light blue, we have the upper Colorado, the South Platte, and actually, as Tom said, Arkansas River Basin was authorized in that same bill, and we had to wait for um, an additional Water Resources Act to correct that and call it the correct thing before we could start planning and executing within that region. So Kansas, Oklahoma, a little behind the others because of that. Also in 2020, we received authority for the Russian River Basin, which is, I've 
pulled it out and it gets lost on the cutout of the map. But it's a smaller basin in a very important region, I would say. Important to protect. A lot of agriculture in this area. South of that is the San Francisco area, the Bay Area. So there's a lot of population there and water resources that are pulled from that basin. So protecting that, very important. And yeah, sorry. So for the Upper Missouri and those South Platte and Upper Colorado, we are routing our study documents. It's called the letter report and our environmental compliance documents kind of all contained under NEPA. They're currently routing for finalization and approval up through our headquarters office. We're targeting onboarding those non-federal sponsors to the states in that region, any of those regions for their spring inspection season. And we, fingers crossed, should be able to make that. A few steps to do once those are approved, but on track to have them on board this year. For the Arkansas River Basin, just because of that delay, it took a little bit longer to get a team together to start, but we are drafting that study document and we're hoping to have them on board by the spring of 2024, if that all goes well. We're in a 2020 authorized our Russian River Basin, as we talked about, um, and hoping to have them on board as well in 2024. Now, the interesting one is the U.S.-Canada border. Not that they're not all interesting, but the U.S.-Canada border region, the language authorizing that is a little bit different. And so we're looking at a couple different avenues to implement that authority. So it didn't call out a specific basin. It just said any basin that adjoins the border between the United States and Canada. So we are looking at international cost shares, potentially helping the businesses within Canada support those efforts to help protect anything coming from the north, south across the border, thereby providing protection for the United States. We're beginning a study process for the Midwest, like Wisconsin, Minnesota, the Great Lakes region. And we're also scoping out several other potential uses of that authority. So this is mainly the Midwest region that we're considering. This map is my interpretation of our authority. It is not limited to this. I have a caveat down there. I just grabbed some Huck units and chose. But anyway, we can protect the, yeah, any border, excuse me, international border between those areas at locations with the highest likelihood of preventing the spread of AIS into or out of waters of the United States. And so we're working with our local division, Mississippi Valley Division, and the local district there to start coordination with those states and hopefully get a program on the ground here in the next year or two. Again, you saw something similar on previous presentations, but again, these are the authorizations over time. I still have drafts in here from 2022, but that's been finalized and I need to adjust those numbers. But you can just see that over the years, as they have given us authority, they've also given us the appropriation. And then that is also translated as we move into the appropriation side, the actual money that the Corps gets to move and act upon. That has also increased over time. And I've pulled out the slide that shows the entire history, but you can just see even from 21 to 22 to 23, again, having a draft there, it's actually 36 million for FY23, that as they've given us that additional authority, they recognize the importance and they've given us the appropriation to act on that. So you can see a lot here over time that emphasize the watercraft inspection station program or related monitoring efforts. And really, that's the end of what I had for the presentation. I'm looking forward to answer questions down the road. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Jonas. We appreciate the efforts to get the word of authorized money on the ground to stop the spread of AIS. Okay, but now we are going to transition and talk about some of those aquatic weeds that Jeremy brought up in the beginning of our webinar today. The final talk of today's webinar is titled Highlights of Research and Management of Aquatic Plants, supported by WERDA. And we are fortunate to have Dr. Mark Heilman here. He's the past president of the Aquatic Plant Management Society. Very good. Hopefully I can run through this smoothly. So thanks for the opportunity. I'm again, Mark Heilman. I have had the opportunity and the privilege to serve as a president of the Aquatic Plant Management Society, which is the only 
organization worldwide that's focused on the research and provide technical information for the management of aquatic plants and algae. And today, I thank Ma, Elizabeth and the efforts with NISA to be able to talk a little bit about aquatic invasive plant management and the research and management activities that are supported by WERDA. I'm not sure how many folks on the line have had the opportunity to see aquatic invasive plants at their worst. So I decided to begin with a little bit of what's the problem, and it's fairly obvious. We have two pictures here, one of giant salvini in the southeast U.S. That's several feet of water underneath that mat of floating weeds. On the right, we have another situation down in central Florida of topped out hydrilla and about seven feet of water. Th these have major impacts on local economies. A variety of research papers have indicated that dense aquatic weeds can reduce shoreline property values by 10 to 20 percent. And our lakes and reservoirs really do have phenomenal value. Recently in 2021, Lake Winnipesaukee the largest inland lake in New Hampshire at about 44,000 acres, I think, was quickly valued in the region at $17 billion. And yes, that's not an a incorrect number of zeros. So just one large lake has tremendous economic value, and you can see why problems with a nuisance and invasive aquatic plants can really reduce that value. And just as a a fun, curious note at the lower when Microsoft was trying to plan an auto alt text for this photo, it had said nothing about water, which is actually pretty accurate. There's, there's nothing to be seen of the water underneath the hydrilla. Other impacts, loss of wildlife and habitat, risks to threatened and endangered species, such as the uh, Everglades snail kite in Florida in the upper right, uh, salmon, freshwater mussels. Invasive aquatic plants really can change and degrade the habitat for these uh, imperiled organisms. And part of what we seek to do with invasive plant management is to be very selective and restore the habitat for these species. Many different water uses are also at risk, whether it's navigation for fishing or other recreational uses, the movement of water for stormwater relief and moving in the landscape to prevent flooding. And then at the bottom, uh, this is somewhat all tied together. It's a Bureau of Reclamation fishery site that has to deal with water hyacinth in the California, Sacramento, San Joaquin River Delta. And you can see that they've got a mess on their hands with a, a mechanical uh, removal from their screening system. Our previous speakers, including Jeremy, have talked to about the history of aquatic plant control and the federal effort. Water hyacinth was what drove this effort. And actually, the Aquatic Plant Management Society used to be the Hyacinth Control Society back in the 60s and eventually changed its name to APMS. And this is all tied together with the Corps' authorization to implement aquatic plant control in the aquatic plant control program starting in the late 50s, mid 60s and beyond with its research mission as Jeremy has described. The River and Harbor Act, still some of that original language is in the legislation that exists today. And from water hyacinth, many other aquatic plants such as hydrilla and Eurasian water milfoil became focused species over time. Ultimately leading to the aquatic plant control research program and its efforts to develop research to inform management by the Corps and, and many partners. We do have other sources of revenue that can be used indirectly in different ways for aquatic plant management, such as the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is an important one in that region. But really the Corps, the Engineer Research and Development Centers, APC, and its related research programs, the only federal program with focus and dedicated appropriations for aquatic invasive plant management. Uh, this fundamentally is a, a very favorable cost sharing program that's ebbed and won over time, but we've seen a resumption of that effort for boat inspection, as well as some other management activities. 
And fundamentally, this program and its research have improved operational outcomes and catalyzed collaborative research on management. And relative to the topic today, the Water Resources Development Act in recent years has played a huge role in refining the, the focus of aquatic plant management in the United States, and developing research priorities, and uh, providing the hopefully increasing levels of resources to deal with this problem. So what I wanted to do is put uh, some real world examples to the impact of the Aquatic Plant Control Program and its research efforts through WERDA. One is a little bit different, but I, I think it's important to note the Corps' role in the development of new weed, ma weed management strategies for irrigation canals. Some of the species we've already heard talked about as uh, far as uh, authorization under WERDA, flowering Russia, hydrilla. And then going to some of my earlier pictures, giant salvinia is a major problem species in the southeastern U.S., which still needs uh, new management tools and efforts. And there's a variety of other examples. Uh, keep that in mind, Eurasian water milfoil, curly leaf pondweed, many other species, water chestnut. All these are very important. I'm just going to focus here on these few today. So with irrigation canals, there's a huge reliance on irrigation in the United States for growth of our agricultural crops. There's about 58 million, I should say, acres of irrigated cropland in the United States. Over 54% of the total value of U.S. crop sales come from farms with irrigation, which, based on 2017 numbers, should be about $210 billion in agricultural products that are supported by some form of irrigation. And all throughout the Western United States in particular, the irrigation districts, canal systems provide critically needed water for growth of these uh, agricultural products. In the 2000s, the Aquatic Plant Control Research Program cooperated with US EPA, USDA's IR4 program, university and industry partners to help conduct research and support the technical and regulatory questions that need to be addressed to introduce new weed management techniques in uh, US irrigation canals, both in season control tools and off-season dewatered use patterns of aquatic herbicides were expanded and have improved control and also reduced applicator risk. Yes, just examples, visuals of some of these injection treatments, uh, different combination approaches, and you can see pre and post treatment, what the irrigation function of a lateral system that this treatment is protecting. Dewater treatments are done off-season when the canal is not in use, and several systemic herbicides are labeled by US EPA to treat the bottom of a canal. And then as the canal is flooded and the aquatic weeds germinate, there's suppression of the aquatic weed infestation in the canal. Really important strategies, newer strategies that the Corps Research Program has supported in different ways over the years. Flowering rush. It's been referenced, uh, some of the role of flowering rush and its authorization under word as a problem species. This is an exotic emergent found in northern tier U.S. It also can grow submerged in, in deep water to several meters. It has expanding infestations across the northern tier, particularly in the Pacific Northwest. Also, has found its way into several Canadian provinces where it's impacting habitat quality and function. And the Corps Aquatic Plant Control Program continues to be a focal point for collaboration to evaluate management strategies, understand better the biology of the plant, its ecology, and how control techniques can best be implemented. A few examples of this in different technical reports in the published scientific literature. On the left, we have recent demonstration of flowering rush control in the hydrology and high exchange reservoir systems out west. You can see the implementation of two bubble curtains as a means to sequester water in a cove area infested with flowering rush to help plan out a management action. In addition, we have different herbicide strategies, drawdown treatments, different combinations with different herbicides, dealing with flowering rush with timing, et cetera, investigations into the genetics of this species, and how that relates to ecology and management. And then finally, biological control of flowering rush 
and looking for different strategies to provide a, another tool in the toolbox as far as integrated pest management. Switching to hydrilla, often termed the perfect aquatic weed based on its ability, environmental flexibility, north to south, its reproduction from subterranean turions or tubers that allow it to survive years and years of management. The Aquatic Plant Control Research Program in particular, the late Dr. Mike Netherland was a huge leader in developing new information and use strategies for control of hydrilla. These focused on both the ability to improve the selective long-term maintenance control of this species, both its dioecious biotype that's found in the southeastern U.S. primarily, and then also the monoecious biotype found in the mid-Atlantic and spreading into northern waterways. And in addition, particularly in the last number of years, as Monetius is creeping closer to the north and into diverse waterways and watersheds in the Great Lakes, the ability to contain, eradicate new infestations, such as those that threaten the Great Lakes, and even a new, entirely new biotype of hydrilla that's been detected in the Connecticut River system. Funding examples of research leading to management. There's a variety of published studies looking at uh, specialized ecotoxicology around, for example, the response of freshwater mussels to different management strategies, the evaluations of new herbicides, new use patterns, the con basic control and use patterns for addressing the hydrilla and its biotypes with our available tools, looking at concentration and exposure time relationships. Tying that to the, the life history and phenology and the Turion ecology specifically of hydrilla, examinations of herbicide resistance that, that have been found in certain biotypes of hydrilla around the country. And then finally, uh, looking at bowel controls and seeking to find that long term from an integrated pest management perspective to sustain control and improve efficiency of management with a biological. Thought I'd uh, again go back to examples of the kinds of management that have been guided by successful aquatic plant control research program studies. Uh, this is just for dioecious hydrilla. These are two separate actions in central Florida, controlling hundreds of acres of hydrilla selectively using different herbicide strategies that were researched by the Corps of Engineers and collaborating partners, such as at the University of Florida. Before and after management, it's pretty compelling. And we get back to the photo that Microsoft would recognize as having water in that lower right. Other examples, this is Monetius hydrilla management. Hydrilla has found its way into a variety of natural flowing waters in the last number of years. And there's been successful management guided by some of the research developed under the Corps' research program. Two examples of the Eno River in North Carolina and the Croton River in New York, feeding the Hudson River, both actions that have been implemented successfully based on utilization of federal research. Other examples of demonstration leading to operations, basically, as Jeremy talked about earlier, these are examples on Monetius Hydrilla. Again, there's been a multi-year project with the infestation of Monetius hydrilla in the Erie Canal in the Tonawanda Creek area near Buffalo and the Corps Buffalo District and the Corps Aquatic Plant Control Program has been engaged with that to reduce hydrilla and its risk of movement in that region. New York has also seen infestation of Cayuga Lakes since 2011 and the Corps in the last six, seven years has been involved in efforts associated with managing around two different areas, uh, Wells College near Aurora, New York, and Stewart Park down near Italy. The Corps is also, through cost sharing and technical exchange, has been able to help other agencies deal with uh, new hydrilla infestations. A good example of this is collaboration with Pennsylvania's Department of Conservation Natural Resources and also Ohio DNR with the Pine Matuning Reservoir. Hydrilla detected on this large system that, as the map shows in the upper middle left or middle 
Uh, you see a wide range of uh, different zip codes in areas of the region and even beyond down to Florida, where boats have traveled directly from that location to Pimatuni. So it's very much a super spreader type lake for an aquatic invasive species. And unfortunately, we see the management of hydrilla has been implemented collaboratively to contain and reduce hydrilla in the system. I won't get into the details in the bottom. You can go to the hydrilla collaborative website and look for some of this information. But functionally, it shows that management has contained hydrilla. It's not currently on a path towards eradication, but it's certainly being suppressed and its risk of movement in the region into Lake Erie and beyond is being reduced. Finally, the last example I'll talk about is giant salvinia. This very problematic free-floating aquatic fern has been scattered across the southeastern U.S. now after an original introduction in South Carolina in 1995. It's certainly well-known for its highly aggressive growth rates, going from minimal coverage to reservoir or lake or pond-wide coverage in, in a matter of weeks or months. And you can see a system in North Carolina I'll talk a little bit more about on the lower right, showing the infestation in a swampy area of southeastern North Carolina. The Corps has been instrumental in its research and uh, investigations of management strategies for giant salvinia since the mid-90s, and it's looking at all the tools in the toolbox, starting with the ecology of the plant, herbicide use patterns, as well as playing a key role in developing strategies for the rear distribution and evaluation of the effects of the biocontrol of the Salvinia weevil. And here's just examples of technical reports and published papers that have guided some of the recent management strategies and the use of integrated tools for dealing with giant salvinia. So I thought I'd run through one example that I've had some direct involvement with myself, and that's just dealing with a new infestation in North Carolina in what's called Gapway Swamp. It's in Columbus County in the southeastern part of the state. This area, it's an impoundment that runs through a canal system a few miles into the Lumber River and then into the Little PD and the PD River in South Carolina. So it does provide a regional risk of spread in North Carolina and South Carolina, and therefore North Carolina DEQ has responded with a, an attempt to eradicate the plan over the last couple of years since this detection in 2020. So I, I thought I'd run through just the outcomes of that. Multiple strategies are being used here. As captured on the last slide, a fully integrated set of herbicide as well as the herbicide strategies, as well as introduction of salvinia weevils to provide a, a one two punch for eradication. You can see back in this time, 2021, we had the areas in bright green in the system. As you go from up towards the north, in particular, the northwest or the upper left, dense green growth that in the first year of aggressive management was reduced, but still significant coverage. But over a two-year period, all these strategies have dramatically reduced probably 85-90% reduction in the biomass of salvinia in the system. And it's being squeezed through multiple strategies from north, south, upstream, downstream to fully eradicate the plant is the goal. So examples of this control, this is on the left is obviously an untreated condition. And again, we see that uh, full coverage associated with the salvinia. Two years later, in this past summer, a very large degree of control and removal of giant salvinia has occurred. Uh, this is a, a connected small pond to the reservoir system that was 100% infested prior to management. That has now been cleared up by the integrated plan put together for eradication. Good progress on that species. And another example where core research through the Aquatic Plant Control Program has led to the implementation of strategies to control and eradicate a problem invasive plant. So a few final comments. Word is implementation. Word of 2022 is actually in an open comment period for its implementation. Just make the links here. You can 
search around and find these. But the public comment period for that is actually open through March 21st. And uh, please look at that and make a comment if you feel it's appropriate. There's already been some summary by Jeremy of where the appropriations came out for this past year, the strong investment in prevention strategies and inspection stations, the seven million for research and development for invasive plants, and then a new allocation of six million for research and control and the new biotype of hydrilla in the Connecticut River. So in the future, the management of where it is usually a two-year cycle and its appropriations are annual. And the implementation and the appropriations are dependent both on technical needs on the ground and also stakeholder feedback to Congress. And so I would encourage anyone here professionally or as private citizens to provide feedback to the relevant committees, the Energy and Water Development Committees in the House and the Senate. Just uh, notes of who these people are now after the last set of elections. Some of you may be in the districts or represented by these folks, and certainly your message would carry that much more weight. But for, whether it's as an environmental professional or a citizen, please reach out, talk about the impact of WERDA, how it protects our aquatic resources, and as I've referenced, especially on aquatic invasive plants. And to finalize my comments, again, WERDA is definitely a major part of addressing threats of aquatic invasive plants in this country. It's the act and its appropriations drive scientific research, as well as management cost sharing and collaboration with the Corps' Aquatic Plant Control Program. And certainly uh, go ahead and express your support and provide input on how WORD is currently working and how it might work in the future to protect and restore our aquatic resources. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. That was outstanding, Mark. Mason's certainly tracking the hydrilla and several of these other issues, and I really appreciate that detailed overview. All right, we are at the top of the, not the top of the hour, but the end of the webinar, and it looks like all of our questions have been answered in writing, except for two that I will follow back up on. So I am going to wrap it up here today. I want to thank our panelists and our attendees for joining us on today's National Invasive Species Awareness Week webinar. Again, check NISA.org for more events in the future. There are over 70 events around the continent listed up there, many of them virtual. Of course, we have our Continental Feral Swine webinar happening tomorrow, same time as today and then bullfrogs on Friday. So I hope to see you at one of those events. Also remember that you can take action to raise the collective voice of the invasive species community by contacting your legislators on key issues through our NISA policy pages. So thank you again for being here and being a part of National Invasive Species Awareness Week. Have a great day, everyone, and we hope to see you again soon.